Hello. On behalf of all the webinar organizers, I would like to welcome you to another session of the AI and Big Data in Finance Research Forum. Today, we're very happy to welcome Mariam Farbudi and Asaf Manela to talk about valuing financial data. There are 30 minutes for the presenter and 20 for the discussant, followed by questions from the audience. So please send us your questions via the Q&A option and be respectful. We're going to have a small break in the middle of the presentation, just in case there are clarifying questions. Once the official recorded part of the seminar is over, we hope that you will be able to stay online and join us for an informal follow-up discussion. So now, Mariam, the floor is yours. Would, like, would you like to share your slides? Thank you. All right, I hope everybody can see my slides. Um, it's uh, great to be here and talk about valuing financial data. This is joint work with uh, Drew, who is like a great rising PhD student at Columbia, and Laura and Benki. I think for this audience, I don't need to argue that valuing financial data is important for investors because in the past decade or so, there has been a huge rise in a collection of data about firm performance, different type of data uh, uh, and trade of this data and kind of selling this data to different investors. That raises the question of uh, how valuable is this data? Because both the investment in this data acquisition as well as anything about the data market is extremely opaque. So we don't really have prices, of a good measure of prices for data. When we think about the question of how valuable um, uh, this asset is to investor, what I'm basically, what we are basically trying to get to is that what is the investor's willingness to pay? So I want you to think about this throughout the whole talk as a demand. It's not an equilibrium transaction price. Okay. So it's going to be a demand card. Now, data valuation is not easy. And one important reason is that how much an investor can profit from data depends on not only data that he knows and his own characteristics and style and risk aversion and many other things, but also on what other everybody else knows about the data who has similar data and how aggressively others are uh, uh, using the data that, they're, uh, that they have. So this implies this impossible data requirement to you know basically everyone else's data set, preferences, price impact, investment mandate, and so on and so forth. What you would like to do in this paper is to provide a sufficient statistic approach uh, to, that bypasses the need to know others' information sets and characteristics in valuing data for a particular investor. That doesn't come for free. So in order to do to arrive at the sufficient statistics, we need to do a couple of approximations. Okay. So you have to believe that these approximations are legit ones, okay, to get to this, to be able to bypass this kind of relatively strong requirements. Um by doing so, what we're gonna be able to do, hopefully, is to measure the value of data across different investors. So we're gonna focus on investor heterogeneity. And we were provided a tool to put not only a value in utility, but a dollar value on a piece of data across different investors, which only depends on uh, moments of the return distribution, as well as that particular investor's characteristic. And what we do find is that this investor heterogeneity, which is going to be uh, uh, encompassed by in investor characteristics, actually change the value of data by orders of magnitude. So this heterogeneity, so, and that kind of suggests that it's that we do have to think about heterogeneity very seriously in valuing data. The uh, Characteristics that we do um, particularly focus on this in this uh, paper are wealth, 
the investment style of investors, which is basically the set of assets that investor can invest in. Think about that as an investment mandate. And that's like a very well-defined thing for like ETFs and a mutual funds. Not every investor invests in the all set of assets. We'll also focus a lot on the price impact or illiquidity of the market. And also, we briefly discuss existing information and trading frequency, which are in the paper, but I'm not going to spend time on it here. What we find is that data is not a common value asset. So investor heterogeneity heavily affects investors' demand for data. So the same data is valued very, very differently. Um, focusing on price impact allows us to uh, get a very interesting insight, which we did not expect out of uh, this exercise, which is we can tie the demand elasticity for data to demand elasticity of the asset in the asset market. There is a, this literature is generally uh, in its uh, very, very uh, early in its life, but there are a couple of papers, uh, in particular, Asaf, who I'm lucky to have as my discussant, is uh, one of the people who have been contributing to this literature heavily. And there are some other papers. Most of these papers think about valuing, uh, putting a single value on each piece of data. And we, so in a sense, that's like uh, thinking about a homogeneous investor. So we kind of complement that literature by focusing on investor heterogeneity. And we believe that this measurement of different data values for different traders is a first step to tracing out the data demand curve. Now, uh, I'm gonna first show you the measurement tool that we propose. Then I'm gonna tell you how we're gonna estimate that. And then I'm gonna use a showcase of uh, this tool uh, to a particular data that is publicly available and we could easily um, use to, uh, to show what I kind of uh, argue. So the model is an NRE model with risk heterogeneity and a lot of covariances. There is one riskless asset and, and risky assets, and each of the assets pay a dividend streams. And the dividend stream is AR1. Uh, it loads on previous dividends, and it has an innovation, YT plus one. Okay. Um, I'm going to use the word dividends and earning interchangeably, because when I go to data, I'm going to use earnings, actually, to measure dividends. Uh, then there is a stochastic, uh, uh, oh, so that this, what's kind of, what we allow is that we allow the dividend innovation to be correlated across assets. We do assume that it's IID across time, but we allow, we, uh, we are going to estimate um, covariance metrics across assets. Then we are going to also so assume a stochastic demand vector for these um assets, which basically um, makes the prices not perfectly revealing, a very common approach in uh, RE models. In terms of in investors, so that's the asset side of the model. Now, in terms of the investor side of the model, we have N OLG investors, uh, which we are going to index by I, that they have heterogeneous preferences, and they can have heterogeneous investment sets. So uh, when I, why do I say N investors? Because I want to be also use the model to think about price impact or illiquidity. And why do I say OLG? Because I do want the investor to also care about prices tomorrow. So think about an investor who buys an asset today, collects it, earnings or dividends, and sell it tomorrow so that we can think about asset returns properly. These investors, given their heterogeneous preferences and investment styles uh, maximizes expected utility given their information and the utility is concave. Um, then each data point is a noisy signal of the dividend innovation uh, YT plus one. Um, and we allow for other investors to know this, um, uh, to know part of this information. So the data might be correlated with what others know. In particular, 
he asks the signal that investor I at time T receives is a basically a linear combination of the individual innovation. It can load on a public noise, ZT plus one, and also it has a private noise component. The information set of investor I at time T is whatever he knew before at T minus one, plus this new signal, plus the dividends and prices realized uh, right before. Now, the equilibrium solution is pretty straightforward, general equilibrium uh, RE. Investors learn both from prices and from the signals that they have, and they update their beliefs using base law. They also choose, so then once they, they have updated beliefs, they choose a portfolio QIT and maximize expected utility subject to their investment style, meaning subject with they choose QIT among the set of uh, assets that they can invest in. And they do account for price impact DP, DQI. Now we're going to focus on a linear uh, uh, NRE. So the prices, which equate demand and supply, loads on dividends yesterday, on the innovation in dividends, on the uh, sto stochastic uh, uh, supply, as well as on the um, uh, common uh, uh, signal. Uh, common basically noise in the signal. Now we want to allow for any investor uh, utility. Of course, to make any progress, we need to do a second order Taylor, Taylor approximation. So you can um, we're gonna do a second order Taylor approximation of the expected expected conditional utility, and uh, uh, if uh, you. Mm, and then when you do this um, second order approximation, uh, the result is um, going to a utility and expected utility mean variance approximation. However, what I want you to, uh, to uh, note is that this absolute risk aversion, rho i, because this is a, a second order a utility, a second order um, Taylor approximation, can depend on time t wealth of the investor. So this is not a, 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 a CARA utility in general. In particular, we are, when I go to the um, to estimating the model, I'm going to tell you how we're going to, uh, uh, what role we're going to use for different investors. Now, the in to get to the investor expected utility, the first thing that we're going to do is that we're going to use profits and we're going to write profits KIT, as returns for measurement. So profits is whatever the investor receives tomorrow, which is prices tomorrow plus dividends tomorrow, minus whatever he pays for prices uh, for the asset today, which is RPT. So now we divide that by PT point wise, and that gives us the return. Then we were going to substitute optimal uh, portfolios, equilibrium prices, price information, and take the expectation over all the realizations of random outcomes and signals. And we do uh, uh, a bunch of other approximations. And that allows us to write the expected utility of the investor, ex the expected utility of investor conditional on his information at time t as the sum of three terms. The first term is what you would commonly think about, which is a sharp ratio square. The second term is a variance reduction given the information, the particular information that the investor has compared to no information. And the third term is a wealth correction. As I mentioned, RI is the return for I's investable assets. So the return for assets that the investment mandates of the investor allows him to uh, invest in, and he has chosen different quantities Q to invest in them. And importantly, VI had had this, this corrected variance is a conditional variance of investor's return, conditional on his information, and adjusted for price impact, which is Kyle Lambda. So... 
Uh, now we can use this. This was in utility term. Okay, we can use this to find a dollar value uh, for the data, which we measure as the amount of money that you give the investor and makes him indifferent between having the data versus having no data, but having the additional riskless way. So the dollar value of the data is kind of straightforward. Basically, it's the change in the uh, utility of expected, ut extent the utility of the investor with and without data corrected for his risk aversion to take that to, um, to in you, if you want, wealth terms. And this is, again, um, very intuitive. An investor who's more risk averse uh, uh, um, is willing to exchange the, the same amount of data with, um, with, uh, with a smaller uh, monetary payment, if, uh, with a smaller uh, fixed monetary payment today. So in this approach, we need to measure unconditional means and variances and unconditional variances. Unconditional means and variances are easy. The challenging part is to compute the conditional variance of investor specific return given his information. And here is where here is where the next insight comes in. And again, this is where one of the assumptions that we need uh, for this um, approach to work comes in. That is, we need um, uh, we we need normal returns. Because for like linear normal, Bayes' law and OLS will coincide. So in order to find the uh, conditional variance, which is which follows Bayes' law, uh, basically you can just run the OLS, and the conditional variance is the expected residual from the OLS regression. Um, of course, you might say very legit that uh, returns are not linear. And so what we do in the paper is that uh, we have an appendix which we show, okay, when uh, we, we have nonlinear returns, we can basically only uh, find a bound on, um, on this value of data, uh, basically by approximation, approximating that nonlinear return with a linear term and the residual. So what we're going to do is we're going to estimate a return forecasting regression with the invest with the data that the investor already knows, the same regression with the historical uh, uh, value of data that we are valuing, and then use the average square residual of these two regressions as uh, as a mo as moments in equilibrium to uh, compute the value of the data. The one insight that I want to mention is that it looks like in the in the um, uh, in the formula that I showed that others' information disappeared. So this might be wrong because uh, what uh, we know that information that others know is less valuable to an investor. But I want you to know that they have they have actually not disappeared because it does matter. The information of others do matter uh, through the return of the investor. So what others know is uh, reflected in prices. So they do not forecast a return beyond what prices forecast. So conditioning them, conditioning on them on top of prices to get the conditional variance uh, does not increase the utility. And uh, beyond that, you can say, okay, this is kind of a little bit obvious. So what's the point? The point is that using these approximations, we can actually map many models into these sufficient statistics. And we are gonna allow for heterogeneity in investors in a bunch of dimensions and in data which is private, public, or correlated with what others know. And um, that is kind of a valuable tool, especially because these return-based sufficient statistics are uh, uh, are important in terms of using uh, the NRE models to actually do something empirically relevant. So let me quickly take, tell you how we're gonna estimate the model. As I said, we're gonna uh, assume normality in the baseline, and then uh, we're going to use OLS regression. So think about the data that we want to value as X and the existing data at Z. We're going to regress investor return on the existing data, get the residual. We're going to regress that investor return on the existing data and the new data and get a new residual. 
and we can then we can compute the two different conditional variances as the uh, mean square error of the residual uh, without the data that we are valuing and with the data that we are valuing and then uh, make take the difference and uh, uh, by plugging them into expected utility to get the value of the data. Now, let me tell you what sh um, showcase I'm going to show you to uh, basically tell you what, how this proof of concept works. So we're going to use data that comes from institutional brokerage estimate system, IBES, which are earning forecasts for a panel of 26,000 analysts for 15,000 firms for from 1985 to 2015. And that's the main um, um, uh, that's the main limitation of what we can do, which is the uh, time series is short. So we cannot control for many, many things. And then uh, in the paper, we're also going to measure, uh, we're also going to value a GDP ex, um, exposed GDP growth. So basically giving investors information which is not released yet. Uh, but um, that I'm not going to uh, talk about today. So the IBEST data that we use, um, uh, as I said, is for 30 years. So it's going to be a short panel. And then uh, the data that we use for stocks are stock prices, uh, annual, and uh, the the exact the information that is known by investors. We're gonna, as I said, because it's only thirty years of data, we cannot control for a lot of things. So we're gonna control for previous dividends and dividend price ratio. We can also replace dividend price ratio with prices and the. Um, results that we get are like pretty identical. So I'm gonna, what I'm gonna show you is with uh, controlling for previous dividends and dividend price ratios. And now we need to deal with the fact that there is a lot of data. And in order to deal with that, we're gonna aggregate it uh, into portfolios, which we're gonna think about as investment styles. And then for the signals, we're gonna use value weighted mean of median forecast of earning growth for each portfolio. We can also use the best performer um, forecasters and we get very similar results. And then um, in terms of what else the other investors know, I, I told uh, you guys that we're gonna use dividend and uh, dividend price ratios. And the key is that this methodology can hopefully be adopted easily to other approaches and more interesting data. <laughs> All right, so with that, let me uh, use the uh, last couple of minutes to actually walk you through the results. Uh, and this slide, I'm gonna go try to go relatively slowly because this basically uh, summarizes everything that I was talking about. So it, in the rows, you can see that there are two blocks. The first block is about perfect competition so there is no price impact. The second block is when there is price impact. Each block has two rows, which is investor's wealth. The first row is a small investor with 500K work, uh, wealth, and the second is an investor with 250 million wealth. Then each column is an investment style, which is basically the group of assets that that investor has to invest within those. It's uh, the investor given it's his information, he uh, optimizes which ones of this class of assets and how much he wants to invest in. So um, uh, as following kind of what the literature has been interested in, we think about small uh, portfolio, large portfolio, growth portfolio, value the portfolio. And we also think about an investor who can optimize across all of these things. So let me first start uh, with wealth. So, and let's think about the perfect competition and look at the purple. So, uh, and look, so let's look at the purple investors, compare the purple investor who invests in all the assets. As you would expect, a large investor values the same data a lot more. And the same data, as I said, is the uh, the data is the mean forecast of uh, of the forecasters for all the four portfolios. Um, 
Um, the second thing is the orange or yellow, which is basically investment style. And uh, so focusing on investment style, which is the orange, you can see that investment style man, uh, matters really, really tremendously. The same amount of the same data, investors who invest in large portfolio, portfolio uh, value it half a million for large assets. For small assets, they don't value it at all. And for the value assets, they modestly, uh, um, uh, only modestly value it. This framework does not tell you why, okay? But I can, so, but I can tell you from the rest of my research why I think this is the case. So first you can imagine, one reasonable thinking is that uh, uh, forecasters forecast is not that informative about same uh, small assets while their forecast is very well reflected in prices already and so it doesn't tell you as an investor much beyond that for value assets lastly and probably most interestingly is the price impact so let's focus on the two uh, uh, on the uh, two red blocks, which is fixing investment style to be growth. Okay, what you can see that uh, first um, price impact decreases the uh, the value of data. In particular, for the large investor, the value of data falls from like about a million to sixty k. Okay. Uh, for a small investor, it also falls, but it's uh, on the second digit, but so it's small, it falls only minorly. The second thing, which is very important, is that um, price impact uh, reduces the uh, value of data for large investors a lot more. And that is what you would expect, because a large investor uh, has to trade a lot and moves the prices a lot um, against him. So um, you can, and so, but looking at this table altogether, you can see that the dispersion of valuations for the data is immense. So to kind of uh, summarize again, what I said, what we find is that more wealth means that uh, investors value the data more. Price impact means that every investor value the data less, but not only that, price impact reduces the value of the data most to the investors who value the data the most. Then investment style, you can see that leads to huge dispersion across data valuation for investors. Previous data pair purchase and trading horizon only modestly affect the value of the data. Um, so let me kind of try to wrap up by talking about this last point which I alluded to in the beginning of the talk, which is thinking about relating data demand elasticity with asset demand elasticity. So this basically tells us something about the data market. And I find this extremely unintuitive. Basically what the model, what this framework tells us is that inelastic asset demand creates more elastic data demand. So data demand curve elasticity and asset demand curve elasticity are inversely correlated. Let's think about what. So let's think about the effect of price impact on asset demand elasticity. When markets are illiquid or um, there's a lot of price impact, that means that investors don't change their asset demand by a lot when prices change. That means that uh, basically asset demand is very inelastic. So price impact leads to inelastic asset demand. However, I showed you that price impact not only reduces the value of data for everybody, but also makes the value of data a lot more similar across investors because it lowers the data value more than anybody for investors who have highest data value because these are the investors who trade on data most aggressively so they're hurt the most by um by a uh, price impact 
That means that the data value of price impact means that data values become less heterogeneous. And so the data demand curve becomes a lot more elastic because if the price of data changes, there's gonna be a big swing in the data demand. And that implies that a, a, a high price elasticity of data demand comes from a low price elasticity of asset demand. So let me conclude by just saying that data is one of the most valuable assets in the modern economy and we need to value it. And um, the, uh, this framework we propose is basically implies that the same data is worth vastly differently for different investors. So thinking about investor heterogeneity is important. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you so much, Mariam. Just on time. Asaf, would you like to share your slides? Yep. yep. Thank you. Um... As I do that and wait for it to load. Uh, thank you for uh, for the invitation to this uh, to this forum. Um, I think it's a it's a great initiative, and I hope that it persists long after the pandemic, uh, which started it. So, um, um, all right. So my my plan um, for today is to talk a little bit about. Um, Mariam's paper, but Svetlana also pushed me to think about the bigger picture here. Um, so I'll try and do a little bit of that. Um, so the question that this paper poses and this literature tries to address is what is the value of uh, financial data to an investor? And er er early on, um, this, the paper says, you look, data is information. Um, and I think that says, well, you know, then they're actually trying to estimate the value of, uh, of information. Um, and there's a large theoretical literature on this value of information going back to Grossman and Stiglitz uh, in a famous AER paper and, you know, all the way to a bunch, bunch, bunch of papers that all the way to a recent paper by uh, Marianne and Laura uh, at the AER. Uh, but there are very few empirical estimates that try to put a number to quantify uh, the value of information or the value of data. And I think there's room, um, there's a lot of room for improvements in, in that literature. Um, so I, 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 I'll explain what I, what I mean when I think about value of information. Um, my favorite definition comes from, um, from previous work that I've done with Ohad Kadan, uh, uh, published in 2019. Um, and there we try to think about information in the sort of broadest sense we can think about. So, uh, we thought about an information structure, call it alpha, that generates a stream of signals. It could be just one signal, but it can be potentially a whole stream of signals S. And what this uh, information structure says is uh, it puts a conditional distribution. It says we can well conditional on a particular uh, state of nature Z, um, there's a certain probability distribution for signals. That's what do we mean by an information structure? Well, now, if you define a value function, the first one here, as the value function of an informed investor with wealth A in a particular state Z, uh, who observes the signal ST, well, this investor can potentially maximize their consumption stream all the way to the future. They can choose an optimal portfolio. Um, they'll do so, of course, given their preferences, but you you can collapse this whole thing into their value function that depends on these three, uh, these three objects. Well, now, if you think about a counterfactual value function uh, for an investor that's uninformed, who does not observe those signals, we're, we're call, we can call their, sort of their null information structure alpha zero, um, then they don't get to observe the signal. Hence, you would expect their value uh, function to be, um, to, to be no larger than this first one. Well, so we define the value of an information structure in state uh, that is state dependent. So this depends on state ZT as the fraction of wealth omega that this agent would be willing to give up to observe a stream of signals, each generated by this information structure alpha. Um, so nothing here is, I think, too surprising. What is nice about this definition is that it depends here and makes very clear 
that value function is going to be some fraction of wealth and that it will depend on how this uh, investor um, compares lotter different lotteries. And in, you know, if you look at general definitions of, uh, of preferences, they all implicitly or explicitly define a, certainly equi a certainty equivalent function. Um, mu, so we we're borrowing here the notation from the macro literature, um, say Epstein and Zinn and, uh, and subsequent literature. So what, what, what mu here is doing is it's taking, is it a certainly equivalent over uh, the signals, ST. Because when the investor chooses, you know, when they decide how much wealth are they willing to give up, they still have not observed the, the, this, this first signal, ST. All right, so nothing too complicated, but I, I, I find this, um, this definition useful. And in the paper with, uh, in that first paper with Ohad, we used this definition um, and imposed some structure familiar from, uh, from the macro asset pricing literature. Um, in terms of preferences, they're homothetic and, you know, sorry, like you can introduce recursive utility um, and very general asset structure structures and this definition would still work and be, um, and, and get you some way towards uh, quantifying values of information. What this paper uh, uh, does is it provides a sufficient statistic approach that uses equilibrium asset return moments to summarize the value of data. So I think, you know, I, I absolutely love the, uh, the goal of this paper, which is, look, there's a lot of things that could be moving around. Let us find a setup where the things that matter for the value of information are actually things that we can get our hands on. So, um, in fact, you know, so I, I love this paper a year ago when Laura sent it to me first time. And when I was invited to discuss this paper, I thought, oh, that's super easy, just 10 minutes to make slides. But it turns out in the past year, they've actually operationalized it. So I don't think the data part was there uh, a, a year ago. Uh, and I think it really adds to the paper. So this paper puts on a very elaborate um, model and elaborate in a good sense, in the sense that it has many realistic features. It can allow for many uh, heterogeneous risk averse informed investors. That's great. It can allow for many assets. It can allow for um, cross sectional dif differences in data sources, uh, which is great. And magically, where I think you know, is the, the big progress of this paper is that it shows that um, as you approach this, uh, this limit, this competitive limit, uh, where the number of informed investors grows, then all that matters really for the utility function. Um, it's just a couple of terms that they can get their hands on. Um, so it depends on expectations of returns, essentially a shock ratio uh, and reductions in uh, invariance. That these are sort of the big things uh, that are going to matter there. They define the, the, the value of the data, the dollar value of data, uh, as one over the coefficient of absolute risk aversion uh, multiplying the difference in utilities. Now, this doesn't have to be a difference. This can be a ratio um, more generally, but implicit in their choice of, um, of quadratic approximation is this uh, is a particular certainty equivalent. And I think it'd be helpful to sort of make that one explicit because then ex an expression like this can be a little less, um, I don't know, daunting or, uh, or surprising. Um, so I think, again, the beauty of this is that most elements of this expression can be easily estimated with data. And that's really where, um, where, where we want to go. So I try to put, you know, so putting papers in a box is hard. So I spent quite a bit of time thinking about, you know, what are the big ingredients that I want to put in this table? I hope that it's not too little that you can still see it. Uh, so I've been working for a while towards a quantitative answer of values of information. Um, so my job market paper a century ago uh, had Cara normal, a car normal setup, uh, one asset, few periods. And what I was really interested in is uh, sort of estimating values of information when information diffuses over time. So you're gonna get the particular signal, but you know that some other investors will get that signal in the future. Uh, and I try to, uh, 
uh, in, in that paper to calibrate the, that model or structural estimate using drug approvals data. All right, so the thing is, if you present a paper like that to uh, people that do macro asset pricing, uh, they're not gonna believe it. Uh, so I don't know what my young experience has been, uh, but I I've encountered with that paper a very strong resistance because if you think about the preferences that are common in macro asset pricing, you know, they're much closer to, well, at the minimum, CRA utility and, you know, let's say log normal stuff. Um, and, but really to match asset pricing moments, you need something like Epstein Z preferences and probably much more elaborate things than that. So in this Kadan Manella paper uh, in 2019, what we did was we, we embraced all that complexity. We, we, we can allow for recursive preferences and really any fundamental uh, distribution. I guess it has to be Markov, so not anything, but that's a pretty weak assumption. We can allow for a complete set of error the Bruce securities, um, infinite horizon, one informed investor. So, you know, one place where this paper, I think, really improves is, you know, well, you can allow for many informed investors, and I think that's important. We also allow for just one information stream or one information structure to be acquired at the time. Um, in that paper, we used index options around macro news to think about things like, well, how much would you be willing to pay, uh, or the representative agent, I'd say, would be willing to pay to know, uh, say, a day before everybody else, what the FOMC announcement is going to be tomorrow. Okay, so that's a sort of uh, systematic you know, or macro information that is uh, that we try to value there. And when you think about this type of very systematic, very systemic news, I think risk is first order. Um, so your attitude toward risk is going to matter a lot. Uh, so I think you know it's a reasonable framework for that. Um, Mariam has an earlier paper uh, with almost the same co-authors uh, in 2021, where they have uh, where they use uh, car utility uh, normal, so essentially a pretty similar model to what you saw today. Uh, motivated a little differently, but car preferences, normal, uh, a normal environment, many assets, one period. So it's less, you know, the, 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 the horizon is not there. Um, there are multiple informed investors, but as I understand it, what they're, uh, the, that paper is focused on uh, price informativeness as opposed to value of information, where they do have an exercise that's interesting for, um, about value of information, but it's more of a marginal exercise uh, sort of what would you pay for the sort of the first little bit of extra precision? Um, and so they do that and they, and they use it to estimate uh, uh, these initial uh, values of, uh, of data at the decade frequency for stock portfolios. So I'll talk a little bit, uh, maybe if I have time, about this uh, newer work that I've, uh, that I have it circulating with Ohad, um, I guess, since, you know, when the pandemic got us interested in, in, in a different approach. And um, in that environment, we sort of took a very different approach to this. We looked at the risk neutral framework, law, but that allows us to think about log normal returns and prices, uh, but one asset uh, and an infinite horizon, essentially a Kyle model, if you will. But we can also think about multiple informed investors. Um, so this simpler setup allows us to think about, to estimate values of information at the daily frequencies for individual stocks. And it's very simple and transparent. And I'll, I'll try to talk a little bit about this more. So what where I think, you know, so it's kind of hard to say the single biggest contribution of this paper is X because it improves on a lot of things. Um, it can allow for multiple signals. It can allow for many informed investors. It can in, it induces a, a, an infinite horizon setup. Um, it doesn't quite have a car utility. It has more of a mean variance approximation about uh, around general preferences. Um, and it, it you know so this is a recent addition to this paper. It even tries to uh, to implement it in practice, which I think is great. Um, what it, I think they you know the the price impact stuff is a bit of an afterthought in this paper as I see it. Um, it's more like, okay, so we can also introduce price impact um, by taking this, or calibrating it to this constant that we borrow from uh, old work by Hasbro. Um, I don't think it's central here, 
but um, but again, I think this paper uh, definitely pushes us in the in, in the right direction. So my only suggestion, I would say, for this paper is um, to be a little less defensive on the assumptions. I think you know you kind of embrace the strong assumptions that when you make them. Uh, I have some examples here, you know, like prices and dividends. You know, they're definitely not stationary or Gaussian in the data. Uh, risk aversion is going to be correlated with wealth. Investors are not as myopic as modeled here. They care about you know, their hedging demands are going to matter there. Uh, price impact is not constant over time or across assets. And in fact, it's highly correlated with volatility. But sometimes I think that empirical progress has to be uh, by, by made by squinting at first. Right? So we're going to squint at it. And you know, it sort of, the model sort of looks like the data. Uh, but that allows us to make progress. And it's good because then future work can come in and try to relax these assumptions. So if the, I think there's a lot of uh, PhD students in the audience and maybe watching later. I hope that you would use this table not as a, not as a scoreboard, but rather as a wish list. You know, I, I, I want this populated much more uh, and, and uh, you know, and smart students with, uh, that are very ambitious to try and relax these assumptions and make the, our model more realistic. So big picture, this is as big as I can think of it. You know, data is very important. Models are very important. The types of models that I like are models that give us a lens through which we look at data. So there's this big space of models out there. Uh, there's a much smaller set of models that can be reasonably taken to data. The set of models has key parameters that are observable or easy to estimate. Um, it has a realistic data generating process, and it has interpretable, interpretable units or quantities. There's a different set, subset of models that can be solved, right? So that set has to be simple, it has to focus on key features, and it's often, you know, linear. It favors linearity to do that. We live, you know, in this space here is a much smaller subset uh, that of models can, that can do both. And you know, finding the right balance, I think, is an art, um, and it's clearly application dependent. So if what you're trying to do is estimate uh, values of information for, um, for a particular signal, you should stop and think, you know, what type of signal is this? Is this about systematic news? Is this about idiosyncratic news? Is, you know, are, are these investors that I care about, do they care about risk more? Do they care about price impact more? I think that's central to the, to the answer. So which is the right tool to, for the job, All right? So in my remaining time, I'll try and spend and offer a different approach, uh, very complementary. It's just, you know, it's gonna be different in the sense that we're gonna abstract from risk completely. In this setup, the only reason why investors don't go fully in on information that an informational edge that they have is price impact. And it turns out that in a broad class of strategic trading models a la Kyle, the value of information takes a very simple form. It's just the ratio of the reduction in variance to price impact. Now, the cool thing is that there's a huge literature on reduction in variance and a huge different separate, completely separate literature on price impact but there's no literature that report, reports these ratios. So what Dohat and I try to do is pick this uh, low hanging fruit. Now what's also true is that the simple closed form expression for the value of information can be extended to log normal values to, uh, it can be estimating at very high frequencies and it provides a lower bound for cases when you have many investors and many signals. So I think of this model as a very, uh, a reasonable approximation for idiosyncratic information. So you think about a hedge fund that gets a tip about a stock and what it does is it can form these long short portfolio that take out all the risk and then just focuses on idiosyncratic information. I think for them, this is a good model to think about. So what we can do with this model is we can take it to data very easily, right? So we can calculate the dollar value of information by estimating the daily log return variance at very high frequency. Uh, dividing that by uh, lambdas, tiled lambdas, you know, price impact by regressing uh, returns on signed order flow, and then just multiplying it by the closing days, previous closing days price. Three objects, I don't know, two, if you think about price, maybe not as an object, 
But essentially, that's it. This is all the information that we need here to estimate uh, values of information. And what's neat about both of these objects is that you don't really need very long time series. Right? There's this old paper by Merton that says, well, you can actually estimate variances very accurately with high frequency data. And this, uh, this coefficient, the lambda, can also be estimated with high frequency data. So you, know, you can go as high frequency as you can. So in, in, in the empirical estimates of the paper, you know, we leverage that to ask questions that I don't think can be answered differently. For example, to ask what happens to the value of information uh, around turbulent times uh, or you know, on specific days. So what am I showing you here? I'm showing you here in blue the value of information or the log of the value of information, really. That's the left scale. And the only two components of it, really, the log return variance, this dashed line at the top, and the log price impact, which is the dotted line at the bottom. It's very simple. The log value of information is just the difference between these two objects. Now, what did I want you to see from this? Well, first, I want you to notice that volatility, top one, top orange one, and price impact are very highly correlated, right? So during, say, COVID, for example, both spiked. The empirical question is, I don't think any of that is surprising. What I think is the empirical question is, which one of them increases more during those times? Because that's going to determine the value of information for an investor that's asking, is this a good time to invest in data or information collection? So this is what the start of COVID looks like, uh, in case you're wondering. So the most, this is by far the most dramatic increase in the value of information that occurred uh, in our sample. And we let, so we observed nine of the 10 highest uh, and value of information days in only in March of 2020. And what you can see happening here is that, you know, as I, as I mentioned, both volatility and, um, and price impact rise, um, but volatility rises more. That's essentially what happened there. And in fact, on some very turbulent days, price impact drops when the Fed intervenes in financial markets. This is what the old crisis of 2007, 2009 looks like. Uh, so some of you uh, may, remember, uh, may remember this. Um, let me see. Yeah, so I have a, a zoom in on that period. So uh, if you don't remember, so on Monday, this is here, September 15, Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy and Bank of America acquired Merrill. Uh, US policymakers are all high-fiving themselves for conquering too big to fail. On the next day, AIG is bailed out. Money market funds value falls below, uh, below, below a dollar for the first time. Uh, and the FOMC really keeps the interest rate uh, target rate at 2%. The mean value of information is still roughly what it was a year earlier. But on Friday, September 19, this is this point right here, with volatility still rising, the Fed aims to provide liquidity to markets by creating a facility to purchase asset-backed commercial paper for money market funds. It also suspends bank capital regulation on this day. Notice how price impact drops sharply that day, even though volatility rises. Both of these effects create this wedge that increases the value of information and make this one of the highest value of information days. Um, we also looked at earnings announcements just because we were kind of curious. Um, for all of these, you can kind of, you probably have intuition about what happens to variance and what happens to price impact on those days. Um, it turns out that for earnings announcement, for the average earnings announcement, uh, volatility rises on the day of the announcement and just and around it, and price impact drops. Uh, both of these effects tend to increase uh, or work to increase uh, values of information. So I don't know, cool things we can do at high frequency, I would say. All right, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. It turns out that even if you allow for many investors uh, that have this, uh, this signal and their signals are correlated, we can attain a lower bound on their value of information uh, based on these numbers that I just showed you. So this is essentially the, the, the Kyle you know, the Kyle model estimate uh, with a monopolist informed trader. Um, it's tightly related to the value of information. Um, uh, when there's more investors. All right, but concluding remarks. Uh, I think data is increasingly available and much more useful than it used to be. Um, 
I think estimating investor demand for information is clearly important. And I think this paper makes enormous progress into help giving us uh, more and more realistic models that allow us to take uh, their quantitative estimates seriously. But again, we, we sort of, again, live in this small subset, the intersection of, uh, of models that can be solved and can be reasonably taken to data. And I think there's a lot of work that remains to find models that can do, uh, that can do both. All right, that's it. Great. Thank you very much, Asaf. I would like to remind everybody that if you have a question, please use the Q&A option or raise your hand. Um, Mariam, would you like to respond to some of the comments while we are collecting questions? Um, I just want to say that uh, thanks so much. And for 95% of the stuff, I can't agree more with Asap in particular that uh, uh, this is really only a first step in doing uh, this data valuation in the small, even in the small uh, uh, margin that Asap said we all live, this is only like the first baby step. So there is a lot more to be done uh, than what we have done. So we are just hoping that we have like ignited people's interest in doing this. And uh, then uh, one particular thing that he mentioned and I love is uh, that we really should uh, Note that uh, our value of data is certain is a certainty equivalent uh, concept using the mean variance, uh, of, and that's like really really uh, great. And then in terms of the uh, price impact stuff that he said, I think it's, uh, I think he's point like for instance relating to Asap's uh, papers, um, in a sense I think as he mentioned, I would like to think about focus on different things. So for instance, in, in this paper, our focus is on heterogeneity across investors. So we're gonna, and the, so I don't wanna think about, we don't have a lot of like time series. We don't have this notion of like time series differences, like Asaf mentioned, like in the time series, volatility and uh, price impact are very heavily uh, correlated. But for us, we're more, the thinking that we have is like, let's fix everything hypothetically, and then say there is price impact and there is not price impact. Still, I would agree very much with Asaf that across different investors, they face different price impacts. So it's really, really, really the um, much um, deeper approach is to think about these differences, which we have not done. As I said, we have only taken like one first step. So that's like really, really what Asaf mentioned. Thank you. Uh, great. We have a question from uh, Michael Goffman. Does CAPM work uh, in your model? Does CAPM work in our model? Yep. Um, it's just a, 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 a normal uh, noisy rational expectation model. So in the aggregate, uh, yes. Great. S yeah, so I mean, in a sense, I want you to, so one thing that, CAPM does not necessarily um, accommodate, like at least basic model of CAPM doesn't uh, necessarily accommodate, is this uh, restrictions of, in, if you want limited participation. So this is to some degree a model of limited participation in the sense that investment style basically enforces an investor to only invest a particular subset of assets. So that's kind of different from CAPM. Great, thank you. Unfortunately, our official time is running up. I would like to thank everybody for joining us today. And of course, special thanks goes to Maria Manasa. We hope that you enjoyed our session today and look forward to seeing you all next month for the presentation of a new work by Olivia Scaye, discussed by Marcelo Medeiras. For all the up-to-date information about the webinar series, please check our website. We are stopping the recording now. We hope that you can stay for a few more minutes and join our informal post-seminary discussion where you can ask follow-up questions. We are going to upgrade all the remaining participants to the panelist status so that we could all see each other and have a nice chat. Thank you for joining us today. Goodbye.